from the College by the Lake, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Local, regional, national, and international guests discussing the issues and topics affecting the way you live are on Forum, the North Idaho College Public Forum, with your host and moderator, political scientist, Tony Stewart. I welcome you to another week of our continuing series entitled Journey Through Time. Today we're going to have the pleasure of having a conversation with Mark Twain, which was the pen name for Samuel Clemens who lived from 1835 until 1910. Uh, Mr. Clemens was born in uh, Florida, Missouri. Uh, he was an American writer and humorist. And the writings of Samuel Clemens as Mark Twain uh, are uh, really outstanding, as all of you know. And I would like to mention just a few of his works. Uh, he wrote Roughing It in 1872, The Gilded Age in 1873, Tom Sawyer in 1876, and Huckleberry Finn in 1884. Uh, as we go to the home of uh, who we'll describe as Mark Twain to visit today, I'd like to start with a quote. Uh, no one, I don't think, was any more humorous than Mark Twain and also with the wisdom he had. He once said, why is it that we rejoice at a birth and grieve at a funeral? It is because we are not the person involved. I think that's a good takeoff on our program today. But I'm also happy to welcome to the program as we go to, the, uh, to talk with Mark Twain, the gentleman who is portraying um, uh, this famous uh, works and, and person. Uh, Dr. George Freen is with us today. He holds a PhD in religion from the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C., which he received in 1969. He is a professor of philosophy and religion at uh, the University of North Dakota. Uh, he is also a former departmental chair uh, at that institution. He was also the director of the Great Plains Chautauqua Society in Bismarck, North Dakota uh, in 1989. He was the outstanding teacher at the University of North Dakota in 1970, and as you would suspect, he's an author and a lecturer. Uh, let us move into uh, our time in history and go back. And, and uh, Mark Twain, thank you for letting us be in your home today. You're welcome. And I'm very happy to have Janelle Burke and Steve Schink Janelle, to Steve. join us in learning about your works and, and, and your great wisdom and humor. And Janelle Burke shall start the questioning. Mark Twain, you were born as Samuel Clemens, and um, you, in your early years, you started really quite young to become a newspaper person. How did that happen? I was about 12 years old when my mother decided that uh, I had to be put in stronger and firmer hands than hers. I, Mother had a good deal of trouble raising me. Uh, she was always afraid I was going to turn out to be a failure in life, and I've tried not to disappoint her. Uh, and so <laughs> at that point, uh, you went off to become a newspaper person, is that correct? Yes, I did. She apprenticed me uh, to a printer, and uh, I set acres and acres of type oh, for about 10 years before I quit working. I haven't worked a day since that time, but uh, you can't set up acres of type without learning the difference between good writing and bad, and so that was my, my schooling. I didn't have any formal education to speak of, and I've always thought that I uh, must be very careful uh, not to confuse the two and not to let your schooling interfere with your education. Steve G. Mr. Twain, tell us a little bit about how you came up with the pen name Mark Twain. Well, I, um, I stole it. Uh, there was an old timer who used to write a column, fairly technical column uh, for the New Orleans Picayune about uh, he was a pilot and uh, he would record depths uh, and shoal soundings and uh, the like in a column in the uh, Picayune and other pilots would read it. And once in a while he'd try his hand at a little larger topic, uh, but the style was always a rather technical, and uh, he signed his name Mark Twain uh, because uh, Ledsman would sing uh, quarter past Twain, Mark Twain, uh, half Twain. Uh, Twain was six uh, feet uh, uh, twice, 12 feet. You could just barely get a boat through something like that, safe. And uh, so I wrote an article imitating him, satirizing him, and he never wrote again. 
well, I felt kind of bad about that. So uh, later on, when I was out west in Nevada, and I needed a nom de guerre or a nom de plume, I uh, I started hiding behind that one. Uh, I see, Mark Twain. I've got to get back to to your um, your writing, um, and I've always been a great admirer of yours. Uh, it, it is amazing to me uh, that you could develop your writing skills to such an extent just by being a typesetter. And, and one of your quotes, and correct me if I'm a little bit wrong about this, but I think it, it's always stuck with me. You said once that the difference between the right word and the almost, the almost right word right is like word. the difference between the lightning bug and lightning or lightning and the lightning bug. That's right. That's, uh, but that's you're such a wonderful writer. Did, did no editor take you under his wing and, and, and oh, help? No, no, no. I, I, no editor took me under his wing. She took me under her wing, and that was uh, Livy. Langdon, my uh, dear wife, who died just a few years ago, but uh, Livy, uh, um, Livy and uh, I were engaged. Uh, we had to keep the engagement secret, you understand, because uh, the family was still inquiring about my uh, my respectability, uh, and I had some letters sent from out west people who knew me, including two clergymen, and they were all honest men, and you could tell, I could tell just as soon as I got the letters, because they didn't say anything nice about me at all. <laughs> well, uh, her father said, don't you, uh, don't you have a friend in the world? And I said, well, I, I, it looks like I don't. He said, well, I'll be your friend. You take the girl. I know you better than these people do. So uh, we got engaged, and uh, just as soon as our engagement was announced, the page proofs for Innocence Abroad began to come in, and Libby read the book with me and edited it. And uh, she was my editor from that day on until almost the time of her death, a stretch of about a third of a century. And uh, she kept me from making many mistakes that I wouldn't uh, had the good sense well, not to print. It was obviously a great partnership, and I've got to be careful not to monopolize this conversation too much. I'm such an admirer of yours, but if I can, I'll ask one more quick question. Um, Innocence Abroad was your first book? Yes. Did, did, tell me how you, which you preferred, newspaper work or, or uh, writing novels? Well, I don't know. It's a matter of, uh, of uh, time and circumstance. Uh, and I, but I consider myself a, a, a journalist even. I'm the dean of American journalists. Which pays uh, better? Well, uh, the novels sometimes <laughs> pay uh, very well, but uh, uh, I began to be a, a journalist uh, after I lost a million dollars. For 10 days, I had a mine that was worth a million dollars. And uh, all I had to do was do a little reasonable amount of work on it, but I uh, somehow failed to do that. And all I can say is that I was a millionaire for 10 days, and it was after that, the week after that, that I was invited to work for a newspaper out in uh, Carson City, Nevada, and I, I did that for uh, $20 a week, which was 100% more than nothing, so I took the job. <laughs> At the end of your life uh, and, and later, uh, there will be many volumes. There'll be a collection of, of 70 volumes, at least, at the University of California Press, and people in the future will know you best for uh, Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn, and this is almost an impossible question, but I just can't resist asking it, uh, Mr. Twain, and that is, with all these works you've done, um, would you share with us one of your, I won't go so far as to ask a favorite, that probably would be uh, very unfair, but give us one of your favorite uh, stories in your writings. Well, uh, if you talk to my daughter, Susie, uh, she would tell you that The Prince and the Pauper was the best of mine books. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, she's not an entirely good critic because she didn't like people <laughs> laughing at her father. And uh, uh, so there was no fun in that book at all. And uh, that's why I like it best. At least I think that's why I like it but, best. Uh, uh, but I am proud of Huckleberry Finn, and that shall be a great book, no matter what, what people say. Give us uh, just a, 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 one of your favorite uh, humorous stories from that or some of your other work. Oh, well, it's impossible to, uh, I mean, in my head it has a million, a million stories yes. in it already. That's a very generous uh, question. Uh, but uh, lately, I, I don't think it's going to be humorous so much, but uh, lately I've been writing a little pamphlet for, you know, folks like yourself who plan to go to heaven and need a little advice 
Um, or in some uh, of our cases, maybe a lot. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> you know, it is, the world's different there than it is here, and the same rules of etiquette and politeness don't, don't apply. Uh, for example, um, don't speak to St. Peter until he has spoken to you. And uh, don't begin any uh, sentence with, hey, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, don't uh, take your dog in with you. Uh, heaven uh, goes by favor and not by merit. If it went by merit, the dog would go in and you'd stay out. <laughs> <laughs> and when you get there and in the streets of gold and meet an acquaintance, don't inquire about the rest of the family. It's not polite. They, they might be away <laughs> elsewhere. Um, so uh, I had you ask me that question some time ago when I was in maybe a more humorous frame of mind than I, than I am in my age. I might have uh, come up with a longer, funnier story, but uh, somehow I just can't shake it. And even this, in this very serious book about uh, heavenly comportment and manners, some of those old uh, humorous ways come in to interfere with my more serious writing. Thank you. Danielle Bird? You have sometimes been criticized by some of the people who read your books as That's to true. the uh, social commentary. What do you say to them? Uh, you've, you've made certain points that you feel very strongly about. What are some of those things and what's your response when people criticize you? Well, I, I don't mind. I don't mind criticism as long as they don't tell the truth about me. But when they descend into telling the truth, I think that's taken unfair advantage of a writer entirely. Uh, but, uh, well, after all, you know, we, uh, we must have uh, critics and missionaries and congressmen <laughs> and humorists, <laughs> and we must bear the burden that God has put on us with those. Uh, those folks. Um, but uh, all I think is necessary to, um, uh, to be critical of others and mostly of one, oneself. Uh, I've been critical of, um, of Congress, uh, though I've often paid them compliments too. I, I was a secretary, private secretary, for Senator Nye of uh, Nevada until I was fired. Um, he asked me to write to some people at Baldwin's Ranch, for example, and explain that they couldn't have the post office that they, that they wanted, but I should do that. Uh, and uh, so I did. I said, what the mischief do you people want with the post office? Well, if letters came there, you couldn't read them. <laughs> and any letters that had money in them, why well, they wouldn't reach their destination if they went through Baldwin's Ranch. Uh, a post office would be a useless luxury in that <laughs> your community, and what you need is a jail. I mean, uh, just a really first-class jail. Well, they, uh, they, they somehow uh, read that and got in touch with the senator, and he burst into my cubicle and shouted that I should leave the premises and never come back. And I took that as a gentle hint that my <coughs> services could be dispensed with. And uh, I, I never will be uh, secretary to a senator again. You can't please that kind of, that kind of people. But I think in America we can be grateful that we have no native criminal class apart from Congress. <laughs> <laughs> Steve Sheen. Mr. Twain, in your book, uh, uh, Life uh, Upon the Mississippi, Along the Mississippi? Life on the Mississippi. On the Mississippi. Yeah. Um, you talk a bit about, uh, about uh, how much you admire the life of a Mississippi riverboat pilot. Oh, yes. It, that, that's your honest feeling? If you had to choose between being a writer oh, and being a river pilot, well, which I, would... I'd drop everything right now to go be a pilot, uh, if the madam would stand for it, but of course she, she won't. The pilot, the steamboat pilot, is the only truly independent human being on earth. And I'd like to be, to what? do that again. Of course, it was the Civil War to put me out of business. Remember now, a pilot stands in a pilot house, which is all glass and gingerbread and the Union's on one side, and the Confederates on the other can't see you. Uh, and so I, I retired from, from piloting when the war broke. I went back home to, uh, to Missouri and joined the Marion 
Rangers and uh, fought in the Civil War for two weeks. Mr. Twain, you told us a little bit about your views of government. I wonder if you'd share with us your views on religion. Well, uh, religion is, uh, is something that we ought to reverence and, and have great respect for and uh, never, never make fun of, I think. Um, it, uh, it is not man's fault, really. I mean, after all, man was made on the sixth day at the end of the week's work when God was tired. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but man has uh, the only true religion in all the animal kingdom. Uh, only he has a true, in fact, he has several true religions. Uh, but the men are, I think, by and large, people are pretty nice folks when they're not under the influence of religion. Uh, man is the only animal that loves his neighbor as himself and then sluts his throat if his theology isn't straight. Um, and of course, uh, one of the big topics in religion is heaven. Um, and I, I give my opinions on subjects pretty easily, but I remember at a dinner party one night, the topic of heaven and hell came up and I, I didn't say anything during the whole dinner and the hostess finally noticed it and, and said, Mr. Clemens, I'm sure you must have a opinion on the subject. And I said, well, you, madam, you must hold me excused. I am silent for, for a reason. I have friends in both places. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, since then, I, I have come to say that uh, I, think, uh, I think it's uh, heaven for climate and hell for company. You also earlier, Mr. Twain, in our interview today, talked about uh, what I would interpret as, as formal education and, and so forth. Give us, uh, as you just did on, on religion, give us your uh, view on the, the educational system and, and uh, formal study. Well, I don't know whether you should start at the top or the, or the bottom. Uh, let's start in the middle with the teachers. Now, you cannot blame the teachers for all the problems in education and the schools. Uh, you just cannot make gold out of lead, no matter how hard you try. Um, it is true to say that it's better to spend our money on schools than on jails, usually. Um, but then at the other end, those in charge of the whole thing, the school board, you know, well, uh, First, God made idiots, uh, but that was only for practice. <laughs> uh, then he went on to make uh, school boards. Uh, so the teachers have a problem from both directions, uh, from the children and from the boards, I, I think. Uh, we educated our daughters at home and in, in Europe, uh, and they did very well. Uh, they learned languages much better than their father ever did. Uh, I had an awful time with that, uh, with that uh, terrible German language. I never could grab a verb in my mouth and swim through the whole sentence till I came out at the end of the page and come up with it. I always had to get it out earlier <laughs> than that. Yeah. Janelle Berg. You have done a great deal of traveling. You just referenced some yeah. of your traveling in Europe, Europe and, yeah. and all throughout the United States yeah. as well. Yes. Uh, and you have used that, uh, your travels, oh, yeah. in your writing. Writing, sure. Can you uh, share with us some of the stories that, and the places that were your favorites? The, the places well, you really Well, my first to uh, traveling was out west, of course, uh, after I gave up on the Civil War and uh, quit and so crippled the Southern cause to that extent. Uh, I, my brother, Orion, who was a ne'er-do-well uh, later in life, he got himself appointed the private secretary to Governor Nye in Nevada through a contact he had in Abraham Lincoln's cabinet. And uh, when he invited me to go along and be his private secretary, uh, I <laughs> thought the uh, heavens had rolled up in a scroll and I, nothing could be more desirable than that. And so bought the tickets and went, uh, went west. I never will forget my first encounter with the, the variegated vernacular of these Occidental plains and mountains. It was in Nebraska. We had come to a 
breakfast stop on the stagecoach. And I heard it for the first time. Uh, somebody at table said, would you pass the bread, you son of a skunk? But skunk wasn't a word he used. It seems to me it was a little stronger word than, than, than that. But traveling is broadening, you know. People ought to travel and uh, work out their, you never met, and work out their prejudice. You never met a narrow-minded, bigoted, mean old man, but he had stayed in that one place all his life long. And yet you still continued, some of your best works have to do with your roots. Oh, yes. Yeah, well, you've got, uh, well, to, got to come home as well as go uh, abroad. Uh, the problem about being abroad is that you're away from your roots, from your people. I remember uh, my first trip abroad was uh, to uh, Europe and to uh, the Holy Land. And the pilgrims were more and more excited every day as we got closer and closer to the goal of our journey, which was Jerusalem. We got there and went right away to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre just inside the Western Gate. It's the most sacred locality in Christendom, and there is the tomb of Jesus. And um, nearby was uh, the tomb of Adam. And uh, the guide uh, said it had never been proven otherwise. Well, you don't know how comforting and touching that was. Here away, in a land away from home and family and friends and everybody who cared about me, uh, to be at the grave of a blood relative. Um, so no matter how far you go, you always come home. You always find yourself thinking. But I remember once in India, I watched a master slap a boy in his charge and knock the boy down. And I thought of my father, hitting the slave boy in our house, and how that felt to me then. And it was just a half a second I left India and came all the way back home, and a half a second more I was all the way back in India. The mind travels across time and space uh, so fast that it makes your head swim. So we're always at home when we travel. And we always travel when we're at home. Steve Sheen. Uh, Mr. Twain, not too long ago, I was reading a book, I think, called The Great Railway Bazaar. Uh, it's a travelogue, a modern-day travelogue about uh, someone else's travels through India. And I think you were quoted in it uh, in a serious vein. I think you had made some reference to the number of people that you saw sleeping uh, on the streets or, or uh, maybe on the railroad station platforms. Yes. Was that a, a sobering experience for you? Uh, the, when, uh, when I went bankrupt, uh, I knew I could always make money lecturing, and uh, so Livy and uh, our daughter Clara came with us. We uh, started out in Cleveland, came across the Great Plains, stopped in Winnipeg, uh, made a couple of, uh, of uh, lectures in uh, Montana, went out to Seattle and Vancouver, and then uh, to Sydney and Australia, New Zealand, Ceylon, and I saw imperialism everywhere. I saw people oppressed by white men, just as uh, we had oppressed the blacks at home in slave times. I think the eagle ought to keep his claws out of every other country. It's not uh, appropriate. Of course, what King Leopold has done in the Congo uh, is almost unspeakable. And I've lent my pen and my name to that anti-imperialism cause. But yes, uh, it's very humbling to travel as a white person around a dark world. Mr. Twain, let me ask you another serious question, if I can. Um, is there another writer whose works you particularly admire? And I'm going to link this with a, with a final question. Um, do you think your works have been appropriately appreciated? Oh, my heavens. Um, well, I have tried to keep it as big a secret as I can that I am a voracious reader. Uh, it would interfere with my general reputation. <laughs> I think, uh, but, um, you know, you can please a writer by telling him you read one of his books. But do you really touch his heart if you tell him you read all his books? But you'll carry yourself right into the most intimate core of his being if you ask him to tell you about his next book. And uh, so it's the next one that most writers are 
most interested in. I've got a couple of next ones. Uh, one, uh, my Bible. I'm going to call it What is Man? Livy hated that book. She forbade its publication while she was alive. But uh, I think I will get it out now. And I'm working on number 44. Not the 44th book, but number 44, The Mysterious Stranger. Uh, I don't know whether I will finish that one or, or not. Uh, uh, the devil has a big role in that book because he's got a big role in life. I'm going to interject here. We're getting fairly short on time. I'm going to ask George Freen to come out of character now. And uh, you're renowned around the country for playing Mark Twain, and, and you're very big in, in, in the field of the Chautauqua Society. Uh, tell us why you've done this and, and what value, uh, obviously it's been illustrated here on the program, but uh, as the learning process the, to use uh, character role playing in Chautauqua Society. Well, um, uh, someone once said at the National Endowment for the Humanities, people sit around and wish they were the National Endowment for the Arts so they could have symphony programs that the general public could come to and not just do fancy lectures that only professors uh, and the elite are interested in. Uh, but uh, we attempt by this simple device of putting on a phony uh, accent and uh, costume and talking first person uh, to reach um, popular audience. Um, and uh, the audience is really better than uh, college audiences. I'm a college professor, been one for 27 years, and uh, have done this for the last 10 summers, and I never have gotten in those 10 summers that hateful question that occurs in every class, and that is, is this going to be on the examination? <laughs> <laughs> or is it important? <laughs> is it important <laughs> enough to be on the exam? Sure, yeah. sure. Uh, the, people just learn uh, and love uh, learning and uh, intelligence is distributed universally. All kinds of people are are as intelligent as any other kind. Of We've certainly people. seen that this week at this series and on this sure. television show uh, that it's a wonderful technique. I've been given the signal we're out of time, but George Freen asks uh, Mark Twain, we thank you for being here and letting us come thank and you. enjoy this pleasure. wonderful 30 Good. minutes with you. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, I would invite you to be with us again next week and we will continue our journey through time. Until then, Please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. The North Idaho College Public Forum was videotaped live from the studios of instructional technology on the campus of North Idaho College for viewing at this more appropriate time. We invite you to join us again next week for another all new edition of the North Idaho College Public Forum on this public television station.